So um, we're now on a time now for our next speaker, uh, Bobby McCormick. Bobby's going to be speaking about the central challenge to freedom of movement. Let me just tell you a little bit about Bobby. Bobby McCormick is a co-founder and chief executive officer of Development Perspectives and has been directly involved in development education and global citizenship education since 2006. Bobby is a program manager of a new strategic partnership program called CELSA, which will embed development education, global citizenship education uh, into the adult and community education sector in Ireland. Bobby has also worked as a senior lecturer lecturer in the Humanities Department of the Dock Institute of Technology and has been the recipient of the Dockus Global Citizen of the Year. So congratulations, Bobby, on that. Uh, and over to you, Bobby, take it away. Many thanks, Denny. Delighted to be here. Um, I didn't know in advance, of course, of, of being at this event that I would have to go after Anne and Mike. So talk about the graveyard shift and trying to, I suppose, be equally, if, if at all possible, or somewhere inspiring in the same way as our two last speakers, but I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I, I just want to congratulate Donegal Changemakers. Just, I, I've had some involvement over the years doing some workshops and training courses, and I just find the work that Donegal Changemakers is doing really inspiring and I hope it's it's a, a kind of model that you know many other regions in Ireland can can just take on board especially especially the likes of the ETB I think you know Donegal ETB need to be commended for really embracing this area of work so I'd love to see other ETBs getting equally as involved um, so really what I'm, I'm here to do this morning is to try to provoke a little bit of the way that we view things in relation to freedom of movement. So that's the topic that I was asked to, to really speak on today. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just share a few slides with you. Um, and of course, uh, Joanne will have the slides. So if it's a case that there's any questions that come from this uh, presentation, then I would welcome any kind of emails or, or contact through social media. So don't view today, I suppose, as, as the, the end of it. It could be lots of opportunities to have further dialogue after this. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to share screen. So Denny had mentioned just a little bit about my own background, and I suppose I, I do have a passion in terms of this area of development education, global citizenship education. And I think an awful lot of what this offers is, is really important to many of the challenges that Anne and Mike spoke about. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about, I suppose, the big picture. I think it's important to remind all of us that, you know, we're living on a rock in a bubble. Now, that may seem a little bit strange to open up with that remark, but I'm taking here from the work of Bill Bryson and the history of almost everything. And, you know, all of us living on this planet Earth, we're moving very quickly, all of us. A uh, thousand miles per hour, but, but that's only one dimension because that's the, the speed at which the Earth is spinning. But, but then the Earth is moving, if you like, around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. And then maybe hard for us to even imagine this, but the, the kind of galaxy that we're part of is moving at 490,000 miles per hour. So really what I want to try and kind of like just get us to understand is that we're moving as a collective all the time. Uh, so that freedom of movement seems a little bit strange. And the bizarre thing is we're never asked for passports when in this continuous movement. And, and that's that's something I want to come back to. Um, the movement of people has been going on for a long time. Uh, you know, anywhere between 75,000 years, depending on, on how you count this, and 1.75 million years, humans have been moving around this planet. It's it predates the idea of a nation state. Migration is the human story. And that's really important for us to understand. Oftentimes migration is, is viewed somewhat negatively and, and we need to go back in history and to understand it. The story of humans, the story of movement. So again, it seems bizarre, the idea of the freedom of movement it seems to be something that, that was actually very recent. So if we, if we look at it a little bit more globally then, um, in 1948, there was, there was a declaration that many of you would be familiar with, known as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in that, it, Article 13 in particular, it talks about two things. And I just want to briefly just look at those. 
One is it says that everyone has the right to freedom of movement. So everybody has the right to freedom of movement. Well, we already know that. <laughs> um, and residents within the borders of each state. So here we have the nation state is mentioned as something that's critically important. And, and, and I, I would encourage us all to be really critical of that view. Nation states are, are a very recent phenomenon and why it must be asked. The second thing is that everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own and to return. And I'm taking directly from the, the actual declaration. So that his, of course, should be updated, but his own and to return to his country. So everyone has the right to do that. So says the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But like Mike and Anand have already pointed out, well, maybe for some certain rights are afforded and for many they're not. So if we can look at the, this idea of freedom of movement from a little bit of a global point of view, well, tell that to the people living in Palestine, that everyone has got the right to move. And um, I mean, you know, the people in Palestine certainly do not have that right afforded. And it's, it's a real shame that that's the case, but that's only one example, Western Sahara. Uh, asylum seekers oftentimes don't have the right, they, they end up in a place, but then don't have the right to, to leave and come back. I mean, those rights arguably are very much denied. Guantanamo Bay is a different type of example. Oftentimes people are brought to Guantanamo in the, in the not too distant past, not charged with anything, but held, held in handcuffs. And, and just to say that, go back to Mike's point about this idea of not being political, right or left, or good or bad, or Democrat or Republican in the United States. I mean, Barack Obama and Joe Biden didn't do very much about Guantanamo Bay, neither did Donald Trump, of course. But in terms of some of the rights that are afforded people, we need to be really careful, I think, in realizing that there's an, a large part of the global population that do not have the same rights as many other people. Um, and that, you know, arguably, if you carry around a passport that says Ireland on it, arguably, you're, you're given a kind of like a green pass to go to wherever you want. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't we so lucky? But we need to be very mindful of the fact that we're very much in a minority. And, and I think we need to then look at the EU. And this is where I think sometimes global citizenship education, development education is really powerful. Because instead of pointing fingers at other people and saying, this is what you should do right in another place, we need to look at what's happening within the EU. And then we'll move to Ireland in a few minutes. We've got freedom of movement in the EU, in the EU but it's all, well, not often always, but it's, it's nearly always spoken about in terms of labor. Well, it's okay to move around if it's for job purposes and it's okay to move around maybe if you're a professional footballer or if say friends you're in a well-paid job within one of the EU institutions and you can go in from Brussels and Strasbourg and fine but there's many people that can't do that within the EU and why is that? Why is it that some rights are afforded to certain groups of people and not to others and I think this goes back to a very structural inequality and injustice that's built into not just as Did we lose Bobby there, Danny? I think we have, his, uh, his screen's frozen. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, no, there you go. Apologies, Sorry, Bobby, I, I, I froze for a few yeah. minutes, did I? No problem, Bobby. Go ahead, Bobby. Apologies. I was just speaking there about um, the right to, to roam in Finland. And, and this is very much affording people the right to move around far more than Ireland, that citizens can move and, and appreciate areas of significant beauty. Um, that's not really afforded to Irish citizens. We're much more of the mindset of private property keep out. So even in, within Ireland, there's certain, if you like, barriers to movement that don't exist in other countries. And that's very different. And that's, that's important for us to recognize that. And I'll come back to that later. This, this slide really is just echoing what I mentioned earlier on about the, the global aspect. It's very important. This is a terrible photograph, but in fiction, in the likes of Star Wars, it starts off with this notion of in galaxies far, far away. Here's Luke Skywalker. I, I don't think at the start of Star Wars, they talked about you know immigration officers and border controls and passport officers. So in fiction, we deal with movement very differently. They're very powerful stories. And again, it's a 
reminder that the stories that we share are often based on movement. And um, this is a different example from Harry Potter, where they move not just in a fictional way, but from world to world. This is how Harry goes from the known world into the unknown. And, and again, that, that idea is very much, I think, within all of us, that migration is quite a natural phenomenon. But oftentimes the way nation states talk about it is that it needs to be controlled. And, and that's something that we need to be conscious of and aware of. This is something that I, I think is, is very important. And it goes to, I suppose, things like storytelling and narratives and how that plays out in development education or global citizenship education. This was in the lead up to the Brexit vote a couple of years ago, and it highlights the role of the media and, and I suppose our professional practice in trying to tackle some of this around misinformation. This is just a, a snapshot of many of the front page um, stories that were told about migration in the lead up to the Brexit vote. And I think we, we certainly don't need to go through an awful lot of, of the very negative headlines, but I think you get the idea that it's a story that's told. And as, as Joseph Campbell said about storytelling, the power of a story doesn't lie in whether or not it's true. The power of the story lies in whether or not it's believed. And that goes back to some even of the misinformation around things like vaccinations. Uh, we are misinformed often about very many important things. Like, you know, the question was raised at Mike about TRIPS waiver. The EU says on the one side, oh, we want to have everyone vaccinated, yet stops that from happening at a, at a World Trade Organization level. I think that old adage of watch how they vote, not what they say is very important, that critical pillar of education. And if we look at this, you know, this is a story that was told that migration is always bad. And that's a narrative we need to challenge, I think. And we need to challenge for lots of reasons because it creates others. It creates this idea of us and them. And, and that's very dangerous as we know through history around propaganda. And, and just to say that a lot of these headlines um, are false, that, that there's actually very, very little evidence to back it up, which I think is something that we need to be really critical of. In Ireland, I mentioned about the private property side of things, just because it's in our constitution doesn't mean that it shouldn't change. And, and I think it needs to change, that it, it actually has very negative connotations, even for things around housing and homelessness. And, and it kind of cements power in certain groups of people and it cements wealth in certain groups of people. And there's a real reluctance to tackle an awful lot of this because it, it, it goes, if you like, against many efforts around, say, for instance, environmental protection. I mean, even rivers, sadly, in Ireland, some of them are owned by private individuals. How, how bizarre, I think. I mean, that just is not the case in many other countries. So I, I think that it's very important not just to look at other countries, although we did refer to Palestine and Western Sahara and others, but to look within our own country as well. Um, and if we look at COVID-19 in particular, and, and this is often a contentious point because we've had experience of, of limits that were, were uh, put onto the population over the last 13 months. I, I don't think necessarily that that's a good or, or a bad thing. I think it's about competing rights and responsibilities. As soon as we begin to talk about rights, we have to begin to talk about responsibilities. And that's a key part of development education and global citizenship education. You know, what are responsibilities as active citizens? And you see here that the, the right to health in international human rights law, um, it states that the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health well, I think when you read that and then you realize that this is legally binding, you can understand why populations' freedoms were curtailed because of the need uh, to, to deal with people's health. So, so I think that oftentimes when you talk about rights, sometimes these things seem contradictory and it's about getting that balance right. It's about realizing maybe that they're not so much in competition, but they have primacy at different times depending on the context. The danger is, and I think there is a, a hidden danger in some other parts of the world, and certainly not Ireland, because I do think that our, our democracy, as, as spoken about earlier on, is in a far healthier place than many countries around the world, and, and successive governments should be credited with that, as well as, of course, the population, but that some countries might be using COVID 
as a way if, of further infringing on certain marginalized groups. And that's something that we need to guard against and, and look at from a human rights perspective. And, and there's a question in all of this around freedom of movement. You know, what, what do we value? And again, it goes back to this notion of do we you know, value labor over other areas of movement? And why is that? Do we value certain individuals more? So, you know, someone who's working in the European Parliament in Brussels, well, you know, their freedom of movement seems to be very different than at the moment. There's children in Greece that have been already given um, program refugee status to come to Ireland. So why aren't they here? According to our government, it's a case that, well, we have to get the guards because it's COVID to travel to Greece and bring them over. It seems a lame excuse, I think, that the certain individuals' freedoms are continually um, not prioritised in the same way that other people's freedoms are. I mean, I, I live not too far from Dublin Airport and there's flights. There's people on those flights. We know that that's the case. Why don't those children in Greece who've gone through hell and back have the same rights afforded to them as many other parts of the population. So some individuals seem to have a different crack of the whip, I think. Uh, collectively, do we, do we prioritize certain groups of the population uh, over others? And arguably, maybe we do. Maybe we do that on a nation state basis. And again, maybe the EU does when I'm talking about trade laws. Maybe the US does. We need to be conscious of these questions because I do think that they're important and and this just kind of this sign I think is something that I see on, on my walks not just within my 5k but going pre-COVID around the country there's areas now where you're told this is private property no access without permission and you scratch beneath the surface and you find actually it's not private property there's a right away here or indeed it doesn't belong to one person but there's now signs like this on beaches not far from where I live and, and I think it's, it's an infringement and it's something to be guarded against. And, and truth be told, I think it's different to many other countries. And as I said earlier on, these kind of like signs, maybe they're, they're a symbol of something else that's, that's more about a value of a society. And I think when, when it comes to movement and you look at Ireland's history, it's based on migration. We're a group of people that have traveled legally and illegally. Um, and sometimes when we talk about that, we, we talk about it in terms of, of labor and, and, you know, working. And again, maybe we need to look at other situations why people move. So just to say, lastly, that my contact information will be available with, of course, Joanne, uh, you know, my email address. And just to say as well, there's lots of resources available on the Development Perspectives website, the sale to section. And that, that of course, means worldly wise. And I do think we need more worldly wise people. And Donegal Changemakers are making a very healthy contribution to that effort. Thank you.